Amphibia. I have been dying to make a video on this cartoon, man. Amphibia is by far one of the best shows to come from Disney Channel recently. And considering their lineup, that's saying something. But if I'm talking about it, that can only mean one thing. The show's over. And I'm about to get up here and spoil the whole dang thing with some stupid drawings. As usual, there's a lot to cover and I ain't trying to make an hour long video. So I do gotta oversimplify some things. These recaps are not a replacement for watching the actual show. Please, if you like this video, go watch Amphibia. It's on Disney Plus. Trust me, it'll be a much different experience than watching this video. But first, I must tell you of the sponsor of today's video, Ragnarok Origin. This is an MMORPG. PG, which stands for man, you already know what this stands for. You get massive worlds to explore with your party, monsters to fight, dungeons to tackle, all that good stuff. And if you're familiar with the popular MMORPG Ragnarok Online, yeah, this is that, but now on mobile. All the same dynamic gameplay, unique customization, and fun community are all now available anywhere you go, like the post office or the Library of Congress. You can play the game on your phone, you get it. But that's not all, because Ragnarok Origin is introducing some awesome new content in their latest update. You got the new area, Aldebaran, which is chock full of new dungeons that'll net you level ups and rewards. There's the new second class job for merchants, Alchemist, which lets you carry a homunculus. Uh, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, a homunculus. One of these cute little guys. They help you out in battle. Plus, alchemists can also use potions and flasks to buff up their party and cut off enemies, and even eventually job advance to creators. But most importantly, right now, Ragnarok Origin is putting on a limited time event full of giveaways and community events in collaboration with Psy. Yes, the K-pop star. I'm serious. Look, he's in the game. Ah, oh, that's great. And all this is still on top of the game's cute art style and engaging gameplay. So if all that sounds good to you, be sure to click the link in this video's description to check out Ragnarok Origin. The special limited time event is only going on until June 12th, so be sure to act fast. Major thanks to Ragnarok Origin for sponsoring, but with all that said, this is everything you need to know about Amphibia. Frog show. So Amphibia is all about this girl named Anne Boon Choi, who, along with her friends Sasha Waybright and Marcy Wu, get magically transported to another dimension full of giant talking frog people. This is how the show begins. They were sent to Amphibia through this crazy looking music box they found at a pawn shop. But apparently, a travel by music box portal isn't very reliable because all three of them landed in totally different parts of Amphibia. And what's worse, after arriving, the music box loses power. See those stones? See how they lost their color? Yeah. Box don't work no more. Leaving Anne stuck in another dimension to fend for herself, completely and utterly alone. Oh, hey, look, frogs. These are the planters, Polly, Sprig, and Hop Pop. They're a farm family from the nearby town of Ortwood. Polly's a little tadpole who's got a lot of attitude for someone with no legs. Sprig's an excitable troublemaker, and Hop Pop is their responsible grandpa who's voiced by Goofy. I'm old, I'm elderly. Anne runs into Sprig in the middle of the woods. They fight a giant praying mantis. Anne's eyes glow blue for a second. That's that's weird. They survive, and the planters take Anne in to help her find her friends and get home. Anne then gives the planters the rundown on how she wound up in Amphibia in the first place, even handing the music box over to Hop Pop. And at first, he's like, Eh. But when Anne's not looking, he's like, yeah. yeah. So apparently Hop Pop did some research and found out this music box is incredibly dangerous. I mean, it's literally called the Calamity Box. Naturally, Hop Pop freaks out and buries that thing in the front yard, covering his tracks by telling Anne that he sent it to some contacts of his to get more information. I'm sure this will end well. But besides all that, this first season mostly follows Anne just getting used to life in Amphibia, bonding with the planters, going on adventures, and putting the citizens of Wartwood in mortal danger on a regular basis. That is until, <gasps> look, it's Sasha. I found her. D d do we, uh, are we supposed to kill her or? So yeah, Anne reunites with one of her human friends, Sasha. She's a popular kind of mean girl type who has a history of bossing her friends around to get her way. It's complicated, but for Anne, it's just nice to know that she's alive. Wait, is that an army of toads? Yeah, so when Sasha landed in Amphibia, she was found and captured by the toad army. They're a sort of tyrannical law enforcement in Amphibia, kind of meant to keep the frogs in line. At first, Sasha was their prisoner, but managed to impress them enough to eventually become second in command to their leader, Captain Grime, who looks Pleasant. So, toads hate frogs, Sasha's working for the toads, Anne's friends with the frogs, naturally there's gonna be a little conflict here. Like, I don't know, trapping the people of Wartwood inside the toad army's tower and planning to feed Hop Pop to a giant carnivorous plant because they think he's leading a rebellion. 
Yeah. Yeah, this is that oversimplifying part I was talking about. Yeah, Hop Hop ran for mayor against a toad at one point and lost, but apparently challenging toad authority turned him into some kind of revolutionary figurehead. I don't know. All that matters is the frogs are trapped and Anne is super mad at Sasha for putting her friends in danger. But Sasha's like, dude, they're slimy little creatures. Who cares? Stop being annoying. Yeah, remember how I said Sasha liked to boss Anne around? We really get a look at how toxic their friendship is here. Anne says, no. Sasha's like, what? And Anne's like, like, uh-oh. Anne and Sasha leap into an intense sword fight atop Toad Tower, but uh-oh, the tower's exploding! Don't ask. The ground starts to crumble beneath Sasha and she nearly plummets to her death. Anne tries to help, but Sasha willingly lets herself fall, saying Anne's better off without her. She falls, but is saved just in time by Captain Grime. That rhymed. That rhymed. So Sasha didn't die and she and the Toad army are forced into hiding after, you know, imprisoning an entire town and trying to kill an innocent grandpa. Which brings us to season two. This time around, the gang's on a road trip to visit the king of Amphibia and see if he can help Anne get home. His name is Andreas. He rules in a big city called Newtopia and he's real tall. Long story short, the gang makes it all the way to Newtopia and finds Marcy. Yeah. yeah, apparently when the music box tossed her into Amphibia, she landed right in Newtopia and befriended King Andreas. Marcy's an excitable nerd who has somehow managed to learn everything about everything in Amphibia in just a couple months. Heck, she's even a Newtopian knight now. So she takes the gang to meet Andreas and we get some more info on that music box. Apparently this thing is an ancient Amphibian artifact used to visit other worlds. And all they gotta do to get it working again is visit three temples to charge up the three stones on top of the box. But of course, in order to do that, they first gotta get the box back from Hop Pop's contact. Oh. Oh. Oh, this is where that not ending well happens. Anne finds out that Hop Pop buried the box in their yard and has been lying to her for months. Will Anne be able to forgive Hop Pop for his betrayal? Yes. Well, Okay, it's more complicated than that. It's here we get some backstory on Polly and Sprig's parents, how they were killed by these giant birds, and how Hop Pop blames himself for not being there to save them. And he explains to Anne that ever since that happened, he's just done anything he could to protect his family. So when he found out the music box was dangerous, he panicked and got rid of it. And he apologized to Anne for lying. Anne accepts his apology, and even though it takes a while, she learns to trust Hop Pop again. So with the heavy stuff out of the way, the gang takes the music box and explore some temples, which goes smoothly. Marcy's eyes glowed green for a second, that's weird, and they charge up the first two stones along the way. Meanwhile, Sasha's been working with the Toads to lead a rebellion against Andreas, her eyes glowed pink for a second, that's weird, and King Andreas is talking to a large multi-eyed creature about revenge. I'm sure that's nothing to worry about. And look, Anne and the gang just made it to the final temple. Uh-oh. Yep, it's time for an unexpected reunion as Sasha and Grimes show up to the temple to make amends. Mm-hmm, sure. The last stone gets charged up and they all return to Newtopia where I'm sure no one will double cross anyone. Sasha betrays Anne by overthrowing King Andreas, who then betrays pretty much everyone by revealing he plans to use the music box to destroy other worlds. And Marcy betrays Anne and Sasha by revealing she basically got them all stuck in Amphibia on purpose because her parents were gonna move, she didn't wanna be separated from her friends, and she just happened to read about and find the Calamity Box all on the same day. Yeah, that's uh... That, that's a lot to take in. It's safe to say everyone's pretty uncomfortable, but no time for awkward silence. We gotta do something about Andreas. It's time for a fight. Huh, would you look at that? Andreas attacks with his army of robot guards and it's uh, it's not going great. Especially not for Sprig who just gets tossed right out a window. <laughs> Might be a good time to remind everyone that this castle is currently floating miles above the ground. So uh, not liking Sprig's chances here. And naturally, Anne is so shocked and heartbroken over this that she channels the energy of the Blue Calamity Stone and suddenly gains insane otherworldly superpowers. What's up? Yeah, you heard me. Superpowers. Anne launches into the air and starts beating up Andreas, but then she's like, Apparently these superpowers don't last forever. So Anne's in trouble, but while she was fighting Andreas, Marcy got to work. She managed to save Sprig by calling a surprise, surprise giant bird, and then stole the music box and opened a portal back to Earth so everyone could escape. Anne, Sprig, Polly, and Hop Pop all jump into the portal and Marcy's just about to follow them when... <laughs> King Andreas kills Marcy, literally stabbing her in the back. And Anne's like, oh no, my friend, dead. Okay. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I, I can't really joke about this part, can I? This is legit the most shocking moment I have ever seen in a family cartoon, Disney or otherwise. We just had a brutal on-screen murder in cold blood on the Disney Channel. But before we can even process what's happened, the portal closes, sending Anne and the Planters to the human world. That's right, in a matter of minutes, everything about the show has changed, and we've reached season three, Amphibia's final season. Anne and the planters are stuck in the human world, Sasha's still trapped in Amphibia, Andreas is wreaking havoc, and Mar Mar Marcy dead. So Anne and the planters spend about half the season in LA, hanging out with Anne's parents, avoiding a killer robot sent to, uh, ooh. Hanging with Anne's parents, avoiding a killer robot sent by Andreas, as well as this FBI agent named Mr. X, who wants to capture the giant talking frog people that just showed up on Earth, and is also just straight up RuPaul. Like, no subtlety. They got RuPaul for this character, so they, they, they made this character RuPaul. And while all of this is going on, the gang still has to find a way back to Amphibia without the music box. Luckily, they befriended a museum curator named Dr. Jan and this scientist named Terry, who didn't run away at the first sign of giant talking frog people and agreed to help them out. Miraculously, this team is actually able to build a working portal machine. And with the help of Anne's new blue energy powers, they're able to open up a portal and return to Amphibia! Oh. oh god, what happened here? Well, unsurprisingly, that's all Andreas. Ever since Anne left Amphibia, he's been growing his robot armies, preparing to invade Earth, and absolutely wrecking Amphibia in the process. All the while Sasha has turned over a new leaf, for real this time, and is working with Grime to form a resistance group to take back Amphibia. Not for the Toads, but for the people. Anne and the Planters join the resistance and start recruiting more teams to join their forces. And also, while exploring their secret headquarters located underneath the Planter house, Sprig finds this mysterious blank letter. And he's like, wow, this is garbage. I'ma keep it for no reason. Blech. I'm sure that won't be important later. So anyway, Sasha and Anne are back together. What about Marcy? I mean, yeah, last we saw of her, she was dabbling in being murdered. But hey, maybe you can recover from a massive flaming fatal stab wound to the torso. You don't know. Oh look, there she is, safe and sound, clinging to life in an ominous stasis pod underneath Andreas's castle. I told you she was fine, but this, that uh, definitely isn't normal. Andreas clearly needs Marcy for something, which brings us all the way back to that giant monster he was talking to last season. This is the core, a giant artificial hive mind made up of all the smartest amphibian ancestors' memories smushed into one, including Andreas's very strict and controlling dad. <sighs> Fine, I'll start the flashback. So, long ago, when Andreas was just a prince, he was close friends with this frog named Girl Sprig. Uh, uh, no, sorry, Leaf. Her name was Leaf. She's upbeat, adventurous, and definitely not a distant relative to the planters. She just looks exactly like Sprig for, I don't know, tax benefits? One day, Andreas was showing Leaf the Calamity Box. And for context, this box was very important to Amphibia back then. Using it to conquer other worlds allowed Newtopia to be insanely technologically advanced. It was like the backbone of their entire way of life. But as Leaf was checking it out, she accidentally pressed all three stones and somehow had this crazy vision of the moon crashing into Amphibia, Majora's Mask style. And she was like, hey, I think using this box is gonna kill everyone. But the king was like, but iPad and war. Dude, really? Ugh, forget it. Yoink! Leaf steals the box, runs away, and hides the box on Earth so no one would ever find it. Er, well, we know how that worked out. And when she returned to Amphibia, she started a new life outside of Newtopia and under a new name, Lily Planter. And the rest is, eh, whatever. Meanwhile, Andreas's dad was like, son, you goofed it, and I'm not proud of you. Oh man. Andreas held an insane grudge against Leaf ever since then, making it his life's goal to get the box back and make things up to his dad, who's now part of the core, and this flashback is over. So the core is a big bad thing. But what does that have to do with Marcy? Well, the core needs a host, a body it can inhabit in order to enact its plans. And guess who Andreas brought as a sacrifice? Yep. The core takes control of Marcy via this creepy helmet, absorbing her mind into the core, taking over her body, and creating the new villain, Darcy. 
you know, like dark Marcy. Nah, 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 that right there is gonna make some things complicated. <laughs> but soon, the day of Andreas' invasion of Earth finally arrives and the Resistance is ready. A full-on war breaks out between the Resistance fighters and Andreas' robot armies. And I ain't talking about an Adventure Time war where everyone just meets on the battlefield and then goes to sleep. This, we get like actual fighting here. All the while, our heroes sneak into Andreas' floating castle and steal the music box. Hooray! What? What, what, why, why are you looking at me like that? Of course, Darcy captures them and now plans to kill Anne, sever her connection with the music box and restore its full power. But Anne's like, wait, would that even work? And Darcy's like, Dang it, you're right, hold on. So, you know, Anne bought herself some time, but that doesn't stop Darcy and Andreas from opening a portal and invading Earth. But the gang jumps in after them and enters the final, final fight. Andreas and Darcy start invading Anne's hometown with an army of robots, spaceships, and even the giant birds that killed Sprig and Polly's parents. Just rub the salt into that wound. And it's up to our heroes to get them to knock it off. But they're not alone. Anne's parents join the fight, having gone through FBI training with Mr. X, who's not trying to hunt them down anymore. Plus there's Dr. Jan, Terry, and a bunch of other people who I didn't have time to talk about. Anne activates her powers and squares off with Andreas. She puts up a dang good fight, but eventually her powers give out and she collapses. However, she's revived by, and I'm not joking here, Black Pink the K-pop group. Anne's family blasts their song as if it's your last over the loudspeakers and it jolts Anne back to full power. <laughs> it is amazing, but doesn't last forever as her powers give out again. So Andreas is about to kill Anne when Sprig leaps in to save the day. Using Mr. X's fancy FBI glasses, Mr. X misdirect. Oh, <gasps> oh. Was that on purpose? Using Mr. X's fancy FBI glasses, Sprig discovers a secret message written to Andreas on that random letter he found. It's a letter from Leaf to Andreas explaining that even after everything that happened between them, she always carried fond memories of Andreas and hoped that moving forward, he wouldn't close himself off to others, which, you know, he did. Reflecting on everything, Andreas breaks down crying. But up in the castle, Darcy sees this and is like, Ugh but they can only scold Andreas for so long because there's a Sasha there trying to fight him. Oh, and Grime too. He got his arm chopped off, it was a whole thing. But while Darcy was yelling at Andreas for having feelings, Sasha snuck up behind and slashed the cable connecting the core to Marcy. The helmet shuts down, the core goes offline, and Marcy is free, just in time for Andreas to give up the fight and get absolutely obliterated by Anne's final attack. Apparently he was part robot the whole time. Who would've thunk? But that's it, right? The gang saves Earth and returns to Amphibia to celebrate? Oh, no, 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 no. Because the core is still active. The helmet, straight up, grows these creepy legs, flies to the moon, and starts piloting it to crash into Amphibia in a last ditch effort to come out on top. So, so yeah, Leaf, Leaf's uh, prediction was right, just maybe not in the way they thought. But whatever, look, danger. And it's up to Anne, and Sasha and Marcy to stop it. Yes! Using the power of the stones, Sasha and Marcy receive superpowers of their own, and they all fly off to have a crazy anime fight against... Uh, the moon? I guess? <laughs> Calling it an anime fight kinda sounds like a joke, but no, Marcy straight up calls it an anime thing. The show just runs with it, and it's animated so well, like good lord. But it's not enough. It, not the animation, the, the trying to stop the moon. Even after Andreas redeems himself by sending his robot armies to help, uh, the moon can't be stopped, leaving Anne with no other choice. See, Anne, Sasha, and Marcy get their powers from their matching stones, blue, pink, and green. But Anne could channel the energy of all three stones at once, giving her power so insane that it would basically be an instant win. But doing so would kill her. And the choice for Anne was easy. She sends Sasha and Marcy back to Amphibia, calls upon the power of all three stones, and eradicates the moon, giving her own life to save her friends. And then things get weird. Anne wakes up on a floating island where she meets an all-knowing, all-seeing cosmic entity who takes the form of her pet cat. Very normal. This entity then offers Anne the chance to take their place and basically become a god. And Anne's like, yeah, no. But because this entity can see the potential in Anne, they send her back to continue her life. Thus, reviving Anne in just the most insane way possible. Where'd all that come from? But with Anne back, she and her friends say their goodbyes, use the music box one final time, and head home never to return. Yeah, they never go back to Amphibia. Everyone moves on with their lives, but no one forgets how their time in Amphibia shaped who they became. And that is the end of Amphibia. You know, 
The Funny Frog Show. I gotta be real, I was not expecting the show about silly frogs to ever involve betrayal, war, superpowers, and so much death. What an unbelievable cartoon, man. Probably my new favorite from the Disney Channel. I'm serious. But there's still one question left unanswered. How's Amphibia gonna survive without a moon? What effects will this have on the planet's ecosystem? Is there a backup moon? What's controlling the tides? Are the water levels in Amphibia rising? <laughs>